You are listening to Aim Higher, a Catholic podcast designed to instruct and to encourage the daily practice of our faith. Pax et bonum, peace and good to you all. This is Aim Higher with Father Anthony and Sister Catherine and By the time this comes out, we can wish you all a very blessed Christmas. Um, Close enough, actually, because it'll be just a few days before. But we'll be pretty close, you know. You know, there's a it's an interesting question. I bring that. I say that is like, can you wish someone a blessed Christmas before Christmas? And I was like, well, yeah, you can say have a blessed Christmas. Yeah, absolutely. Just. I guess you I know. understand the struggle of mm-hmm. you know, should you, shouldn't you. So, but um, it'd be a really no different, you know, someone who knows your birthday's mm-hmm. coming up, but it's not your mm-hmm. birthday, but we'll wish, wish you, you know, I hope you have a happy birthday. So yeah, same um, concept. Yeah, it, it does get, um, as we talked about this, not on the podcast, but to each other, the fact that when we both worked in retail, you know, we worked in the grocery stores mm-hmm. and um unfortunately you know with the way uh it all goes christmas things were brought in early uh you know we started playing christmas music after thanksgiving because yeah. it's you know the preparation and because it's a you know, grocery store there's even you know to get an earlier start so um mm-hmm. you know i don't think i really like overthought the the idea like well uh I'm doing something wrong by working <laughs> and everybody's well, like Christmas mode. Right. Um, but yeah, yeah I, yeah, I don't, I don't think I, so. I, I wore holiday flair, you know, we wear like silly headbands, you know, buttons and stuff like that. Just because it was yeah. busy. You know, a lot of us are working overtime and you got to have, you, you need to do what you can to keep uh, sanity. <laughs> yes, yes, definitely. Well, I, I, I actually, that was really like the only time that, I guess, if you want to use religious persecution, um, in a, in a very broad sense, I've ever experienced in the workplace had to do with Christmas because when I came, like working at Panera Bread, worked there for many years, uh, was a pretty good job actually, and. I would, I was forced to work the registers. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's like one of the only times that I can really relate to my patron, St. Anthony of Padua. You know, he, all he wanted to do was the most menial jobs, the cooking and, and the gardening and do all that. He didn't want people to know his talent. So, he, so he wouldn't have to do these things. I didn't want people to put me on the register. I wanted to be in the back doing prep, making sandwiches, or that's what I wanted so to are do. Are you saying that you were you were very talented on the register? Because I, I was don't... very oh. talented on the I register. I don't really remember you working on the register. You you were no longer working there at that one. Okay, at, at that one. It's kind of funny talking about Panera Bread. At least you know, gosh, it's been a very long time since I worked yes. there. Obviously, but when I first started working with the company, it was very. Uh, Girls work in the bakery and on register, and the boys mm-hmm. were on the, the food line. Yep. Um, and I'm sure, like in today's world, people would be in an uproar over it. But there was there was the idea that girls were better on register, better well, at yeah. to the customers, and boys were better, or men, I should say, women, men were better on those things. But then it started crossing over. I mean, it actually was very. I kept asking to learn to work on the line, yeah. and luckily they listened to me because one fall semester they didn't have anybody all the college kids went back to work and no I yeah working quite a bit well, um, I, the reason i went well what i was saying was <laughs> sorry. was that you know I, because i actually have a i i guess i have a pleasant attitude uh they put they was said we're gonna have you learn to register i kind of fought it i didn't want to be on the register because i found it boring but it's not boring during a rush no. It's actually not boring at all. And that's, you know, because you're dealing with customers more. It's where the boss, you know, the managers came to me and said, you know, um, you know, this this was in Mequon, Wisconsin, which is predominantly a Jewish community. 
Um, and they said, well, you probably shouldn't wish a Merry Christmas. You Maybe you should say, you know, season's greetings or happy holidays. You know, I looked at him. I said, look, I'm saying Merry Christmas. If they want to wish me a happy Hanukkah, go right ahead. But mm-hmm. I'm not, it's not like I'm, you know, insulting them by saying Merry Christmas. If they want to be insulted, I, 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 most of them don't care. No. And also having my button, Merry Christ Mass. They talked about that. I said, you wanted me to wear buttons. I'm not wearing a fat man on a, on a reindeer, okay? Eating I'm wearing fan. this one. <laughs> I was like, this is what Christmas is about. Yes. You know, Mary, the Blessed Mother, Christ, our Savior who is born, and the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass who is set on uh, midnight. That's what it's all about, man. So, you know, Linus got it right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. So, um, you know, because we got kind of sidetracked here, I, I kind of forgot uh, the whole reason I mentioned. I even mentioned Panera Bread and, and working Christmas season because I started thinking about just everything else with Panera Bread and all the experiences there. Um, mm-hmm. But so I guess it's the only time I've actually encountered any resistance to. Oh, now I remember. So, but it's not like I go out of my way to not wish people um, Merry Christmas. I said, I, even today I walk up mm-hmm. and when you're religious, yes, you, you, if you don't do that, your people are going to get the ba- a bad impression of you. Absolutely. Well, we had just gone out this morning to get more uh, chicken feed and uh, the lady there um, who had, oh, had this little, I don't know how old the dog was, but it's, it's, she, she referred to him. He's like, he's in ho- hospice more or less. Like he can't walk. He's got a large heart, but she's taking care of him. So he was very sweet. And as we were leaving, she wished us a Merry, wished us a Merry Christmas. And of course we responded back. Cause you know, it's less than two weeks away. So, um, and you're right. We have to recognize that, um, especially as Catholics, it's coming. It's well, coming. I- I want someone to have a Merry Christmas. Absolutely. I want them to have a blessed Christmas. Yeah. I want them to, you know, make the most out of the graces that flow on this yes. most holy day. Uh, I think we tend to overthink some mm-hmm. of these things and yeah. get a little too critical of others, of ourselves. Um, when it, it, yeah. As you said, it is wishing them a Merry Christmas. You want them to have a Merry Christmas. And who knows what that greeting might be, what will help others remember what it really is about you know, our Lord's birth. So Feliz um, Navidad. Oh yes. Feliz Navidad. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> when I was a kid, I love that song. Yes. Uh, but so it kind of brings what the main topic of this episode is going to be. Uh, we're going to delve kind of into, well, a tradition which is uh, something that's become a staple uh, for communities, for families, for most of the Western speaking world is the Christmas Carol. So many uh, adaptations of movies have been made of this story by Charles Dickens, who, as uh, most of us, most of us know was a, was a, English writer. He was also a social critic during the Victorian era. So that's Victorian era is like what, like the 1800s, somewhere around there. And I, you, if you have even just some background, some literary background, you've heard the name Charles Dickens, either it's from Oliver Twist, uh, (laughs) Taylor (laughs) Taylor (laughs) Twist. (laughs) <laughs> I should have known, you know, just the thing is Oliver, T- Oliver Twist, the story of Oliver Twist has just been so like a big such part a, of the, our theatrical experience yeah, yeah, that you family. kind of forgot, yeah. forgot that. Oh yeah, I know the musical. It, <laughs> it was a book? Oh my word. Hey, you know what? I, I know when you learn how much you have to cut out of when they do a book adaptation, uh, movie adaptation of a book and how much you have to cut out. There was stuff in Oliver Twist I had no idea about. It's like yeah. I did the musical. I'm telling people the story, and I'm like, "Oh wow, I don't really know the story 
at all. Um, I only just know, you know, Bill Sykes, the guy who steals and beats people because yeah. that's the part I played. But anyway, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, don't, conversation for another time. Don't, yeah, don't, don't, <laughs> don't, don't worry. Art is not an imitation of life. All right, it was just art. <laughs> But anyway, you know. but anyway, but then also uh, Nicholas Nickleby. Um, oh. Uh, oh, I know there's others, but the Christmas Carol, I think, is probably his most famous work. And especially this time of year, uh, you, you see theater groups doing the uh, stage adaptation. I, even even now, I get kind of tempted. It's like, <laughs> Should I just, you know, because Wes Ben is doing a uh, production of it, kind of tempted to go see it, but oh, uh, you're here to say you're tempted to go try out for it. It's like, uh, oh, I know, no, I know you no, can't, no, I know no, no. you're not, but it was just that I could have tried out. Well, I mean, I still thought. could be tempted to all go out for it, but uh, to see it, <laughs> and I don't have the time, I don't have the time, uh, especially when I have to do podcasts. No, um, have to but get anyway, to. It's get to. I get to do the podcast, yes, and. With the Christmas Carol, it, it's just, I don't know, I, it's always been there. I mean, growing up, I, my first introduction to the Christmas Carol was probably Mickey's Christmas Carol. Which is a good version. It is uh, a good adaptation, it, yeah. It's interesting, oh. well, two things. I do think if you have a Disney subscription, it is on there. Uh, yeah. And we, we had a... Um, VHS tape where you know we taped it off a of TV and we had we had this one golden tape not really golden but of Christmas stuff that we would watch every year and that was on there and we actually have <laughs> I guess what you would call an extended version because there's actually a scene in there that when I saw it in later time I can't remember what it was but when I saw uh, it on TV many years ago again I was like oh they don't have that scene in there can't tell you what it is I'd have to I'd have to watch it again to mm -hmm. know not that it's important but that is actually a very a very good um not my top no, favorite, no not my favorite but not it, my favorite it's a it, i think it's a great one to introduce to the children well and, and the one that i i, I remember our uh, dad used to watch and dad watched it pretty much like every year around christmas was like the 1952 53 version by alice with alistair sim as scrooge and I recently watched that. I watched that on Thanksgiving. I figured I'd just get it out of the way. And I said, you know, this is really good. And, and 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 for a lot of people, it was considered the definitive version. And there have been other ones made, uh, like one with Patrick Stewart playing Scrooge. Oh, um, I mean, I, w I was told that was a really good one. And oh. I just, I, I haven't seen it. I haven't put up. Uh, it, that would have to depend on who said it was a good version because uh you know a lot of people or i should yeah yeah i i do <laughs> well i you know i i don't know if she's listening to this podcast but uh she knows who she is and <laughs> um i have to tell her you know she's just well, this would be the test to find out if i if she, we have the same kind of taste um it, i also seen two musical versions of it the one scrooge which um if you want to torture my father you make him sit and watch that he hates it that's with um albert finney as scrooge oh he has um, his hate for that. i well, i i actually watched that um it was new year's eve about four years ago and i remember you know eating stew <laughs> watching it wait, wait I, when did you watch it a uh, New Year's Eve. Oh, New Year's Eve. I thought you said yeah. Christmas Eve, and then you're talking about no. eating stew, and I'm like, Father, yeah. unless that was yeah. a Sunday, four what are years you doing? Four, four <laughs> years ago. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I remember, I, and the reason why that stands out is because I remember um, I had, we had a lot of snow, and I had to shovel us out, and the plow came through that night, but the plow decides to come through and puts this big big wall of snow right on our sidewalk so i was like well that was really nice of you but you, couldn't you go a little further and get onto the grass so i had to go knock this whole thing down and that's why i remember this not so much for the movie but having a shovel 
Um, so there, there are a lot of versions. I'm not saying I've seen them all. That'd be interesting to say I've seen them all. My favorite version. Yes. And I think it's our favorite version. Yes. Yes. It's yes. the Muppets Christmas Carol. Yep. It was, that's just, it's too uh, terrifically done. <laughs> and and a, there, there, there is a, a, a video on YouTube. I, I, I forget who the, the guy is who put it out, but it's called the perfect adaptation. And I'm like, yeah, it was at, it's actually quite close to the, um, uh, uh, to uh, to the story itself, and and I think the thing the thing that they did in the Muppets Christmas Carol that really brought brought me into it was the fact that they had Gonzo playing Charles Dickens, and he's narrating the story because it is Charles Dickens' story. He is the one narrating it to you, and of course, having Gonzo and Rizzo and they're back to forth, uh, they're back and forth. It's just it's good, it's great. It's good. I, it's... I, 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 and the music. I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to watching it this year. Michael uh, Caine as Scrooge was brilliant. Perfect. perfect. Yeah. Um, of course, I'm so, as they were talking, another version popped in my head, the 1984 version with George C. Scott. I've seen part of that one. It's not okay. bad. It's kind of creepy. Uh, okay. Not bad, but it's not the Muppets. No, it just, <laughs> uh, <of> <laughs> and, and it's funny because, uh, you know, we grew up watching the Muppets and the fact that that was made after Jim Henson had died. Mm. And I remember when Jim Henson died, like I remember so hearing I. about the news and it actually upset me because that's, yep. you know, the Muppets, the Muppets were something that we were. Uh, yeah. It was part of our life. Yeah. Right. We enjoyed the comedy, the singing, all that. I, so memories, memories are with grandma Parr. Yes. Associated with the Muppets. So there's a lot of sentimentality too. Right. And in some ways, I don't think I was old enough to have like a hesitancy to watch it out of like, well, it's not Jim Henson, you know, but uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, they it's, did a fantastic job. Uh, and yeah. I'm just curious if any of our listeners actually have, I'm sure people have seen it. Yeah. Have, you know, I don't know. If they. Uh, I, I mean, seen it, everyone has like their favorite version. If they have a favorite version, right. uh, one they prefer. And yeah, there's a bit of that comedy, the lightheartedness, but it deals with oh, a, yeah. a lot of uh, the, 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 con the darker content. Mm -hmm. If you want to use darker, uh, the serious content, it, it, it does it respectively. And it is creepy. Mm -hmm. You know, there's even a scene in there during when the ghost of Christmas future comes in. And it's like, you know, Rizzo's like, oh, this get pretty creepy. It's like, I don't want to be here. Gonzo's like, when you're right, you're right. All right, folks, we'll see you at the finale. You know? yeah. <laughs> so it was yeah. so scary. They wouldn't even stick around. So, I mean, I, those are things about it I really do appreciate. Um, mm -hmm. the, the music, uh, yeah, I, the Ghost of Christmas Presents yeah. music. I don't know how many times I've sung that in my life. It's yeah. such a great song. Yeah, it is. Um, but and, he, and you'd sing it now, except, you know, Disney owns the rights to it. Yeah, and we don't Disney get owns flaked. the rights. I, 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 don't, I don't, I think Jim Henson would have been okay. Or Brian Henson would be okay with it, but you know Disney might not. The, but, the, mouse, the mouse might not. I'm not I'm gonna... sure people are wondering though, like why? Why are you bringing up the Christmas? <laughs> like, what does it have to do with a Catholic podcast? And mm. uh, we've got yeah. our we got our reasons. Father we've got is, the reason. Oh, Father's <laughs> done some. I've uh, done some research. research. I've done some work. I have been listening to the audiobook. I haven't so finished have I. it yet, but even just the, I think I've gotten through. Half, not quite half of it, but even just you know hearing it, mm -hmm. uh, there's some things that just come to my mind in, in, in regards to spirituality and all that. Mm -hmm. So um, that's why we thought it would be kind of interesting to talk about. Well, yeah, and well, like especially since people are I'm sorry, especially since people are trying to find things that are of, I guess, entertainment mm -hmm. um, to be, bring out talking points, you know, and maybe this will be like the guide, you know of guiding other people you know to their children you know well, we're gonna watch this movie and then we can kind of like talk about some spiritual aspects about it so that's kind of i think our goal here yeah i think dad used to do that to us well there is usually <laughs> i mean a good story do, does usually involve having a, a moral um lesson mm -hmm. there um mm -hmm. there's a term yep. for that there what's that term the moral of the story okay well 
I think that's, a, you know, that's an important conversation. Mm-hmm. And we know having dialogue is just critical to understanding things. So, well, the symbol of the story. Yeah, the uh, the themes of the story, the symbols contained in the story. I think what if I had to give a little background to what kind of prompted me to to this is that I've been doing a lot more. I can't really say reading as much because people know how busy I am. And uh, <laughs> it's kind of funny saying that way. Or I should put it this way, how busy a priest can be. And he has to do a lot of work, a lot of mindless stuff. So I have, you know things playing in the background mm-hmm. i've been listening to a lot of lord of the rings uh J.R. tolkien's works um and just his catholic background and delving into the catholicism the lessons contained in his works uh is really uh is really lit something in me and made me appreciate uh, well it's also i still oh good i was into this when i was younger so it's not going to waste this is not some of that information that i now have to try to erase from my mind <laughs> i can actually use it as a tool uh helping understanding the faith in, the, in in this world to look into the uh even though tolkien hated allegory um but to look into the allegory um in stories and how they relate to us in life and our journey towards God. Mm -hmm. Um, And I said, well, the Christmas Carol is so full of that. So I did what any good high schooler would do. I (laughs) went onto YouTube and I went onto course hero and I listened to an expert explain the Christmas Carol. Uh, I, I, I said, I know the story, but I needed it bro. I needed to have it uh, broken down for me. Uh, and uh, he separated it into the story itself, into the different chapters or staves as they're called. And, and I, I found it very good. I've used it before in some of my works, some of my writings and by golly, I'll use it again. Um, anyway. So with the Christmas Carol, I, like I said, the there are three themes that we see come out in the Christmas Carol itself, like wealth versus poverty. This was something that was was an issue back in Dickens' time, and we see actually as an issue today. I really don't want to get into too much of that because it's not be some social uh, uh, commentary, but but you actually have have seen it throughout all of history those who have much and those who have very little. Also, there's a theme of redemption and also the theme of time. So you'll see how these things all connect together. In in the Christmas Carol, we are for, we are introduced first to Ebenezer Scrooge. We all know the, the name Scrooge and how it's synonymous with someone being very negative and disliking um, everything and anything that is good, um, jolly, cheerful, optimistic. Scrooge is the pessimist. He is he is the greedy, miserly pessimist who just always looks for the negative of a situation. And in that, he also uh, looks at people's intentions and their angles. Um, and if a person does not have a, um, I'm going to say a, uh, self-serving intention for the good works, he's going to assume they're just a fool, that they're an idiot because they want to wish a Merry Christmas. I guess, um, not that you asked my opinion, but it, it just kind of like something in my mind of something I read recently um, cause you know, Scrooge's idea is that, um, I, uh, nothing's worth doing unless there's some sort of self-serving purpose. Right. And, mm-hmm. um, it was talk, it was talking about like our intention of doing things and how, uh, if we're all very honest, any good deed that we do, even though we, we we're doing so for the good of our neighbor, for the love of God, there's still, a little bit of a self-serving 
element to it. Um, it might not be your uh, primary motive, but and then I guess in a way it is because the reason why we do these things is okay, obviously for the love of our neighbor, her love of God, mm -hmm. and we know that we do those things and do them well, we will go to heaven. Mm -hmm. So, and we want to go to heaven, right? So it, um, it all I, goes together. Right. And I think, you know, someone like Scrooge, you know, just can't wrap his head around um, that really our rewards are not going to be here on earth. You know, yeah. we were, we were thinking of that eternal reward well, and, yeah. and I think that's a lot of people's hang up when it comes to the faith. It's just like, well, but why must I wait? Well, well I think I, I, wait. So, yeah. And, you know, Scrooge is the example of the avaricious man who's weighed down by his wealth. Um, having no, uh, having the knowledge that he won't be able to take this with him when he dies, but still trying to collect more and more and more. Did he have that knowledge? I mean, is that, that, I mean, um, deep down, Everyone, everybody, yeah. everybody knows that. Whether they okay. want to acknowledge it, okay. on, you know. Even though they don't vocalize it. I mean, I, yeah. the yeah. thing is, we, I know that's true for myself. I know I won't take it with we, me, and I know you won't take things yeah, with you, yeah. but. We internally know that. Well, whether okay. a person wants to deny that, uh, it's, a, it's like a reality you can't escape. You know that, well, well, I mean, I there was a case of the ancient Egyptians and other cultures that bury themselves with their goods because they thought they're taking it with them. So I suppose you could say you could uh, propose the theory that some people don't actually realize that, but, but there's probably uh, is something on a deeper level that we yeah, just do. We do. We do. Um, just like, you know, we're not going to get out of this world alive, no matter what you do <laughs> to, to uh, prolong your health you're still, mm -hmm. you're going to die. Mm -hmm. uh, you heard it here on the podcast. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't know it then, you know it now, but. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> I'm going to die? <laughs> so, this, is, but, this is news to but me. But how many people act as if, you know, we're going to live forever or, um, or they have the mindset, well, I'm going to die. So what difference does it make? Well, every, everything we should do should be intentional in the sense of intentionally good. Um, well. And having the people, the idea that I'm going to, when I die, I'm going to be dead. Mm -hmm. That's the end of my existence. Mm -hmm. That's probably the most terrifying thought in my mind. The <laughs> fact that you're not going to exist. And you know, the, what the, that's the, we're going to get into it more, but that's like one of the many consolations you can give to those who are suffering in this life that they, they don't suffer needlessly. They, they're suffering um, it, or I should say they go through suffering, but they will be rewarded in the next life if they do it patiently. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> excuse me. That's a, that's a point there. Um, anyway, sorry. No, it's okay. Cause we're talking here. That's what we're supposed to talk. But the first, uh, chapter is Marley's ghost. Uh, you open up in Scrooge's counting house. He's, he's what we would call nowadays, like a loan shark. Uh, he's a lender. He's a banker. He's a lender. Uh, he lends out money to people, and I'm sure he charged outrageous interest. Well, it, and he has his mild-mannered, uh, kindly secretary, Bob Cratchit, who is also uh, who's also a I should I I should put it this way: who is not exempt from Scrooge's lack of charity, because. There's barely any coal that keeps the office warm. So, you know, he has to try to, you know, uh, keep himself warm with the candle. Only Scrooge to pay for the candle so Cratchit can see so he can do his book work. But in this that in this uh, in this chapter, you have Scrooge's nephew comes to visit him, his only living relative, and says to invite him to Christmas dinner and to enjoy family and friends and and Scrooge's mind that Fred, since he is not wealthy, has no right to be merry. Yeah. Uh, and he said, like, Christmas is a foolish time for, pe for when people want something for nothing and spend more than they can afford. Now, I'm not going to knock Scrooge off for um, 
um, for that statement um, w w without, you know, examining it a bit. Now, he, he didn't do it out of charity, but it is something that people have to uh, acknowledge be of uh, the virtues of prudence and temperance. So yes. we, we do need to be prudent with what we have. We can't just start spending money we don't own uh, and then find ourselves into debt needlessly. Mm -hmm. We have, we do have to look forward and use these things of this earth wisely and be temperate with these things. You know, Christmas often is a time for celebration, um, eating and drinking. And as people would say, making merry, which is good in itself, as long as it's done with temperance, as long as we don't overeat, overindulge, how many people, who get drunk on Christmas Day. You're not honoring the babe of Bethlehem by doing this. So we have to have that uh, Catholic outlook of the day. And and the primar primary reason is to celebrate the birth of Christ and the promise of our redemption. So that, well, that is a thought that will keep us on the right temperate and prudent path. Right. And then you don't really have to, I think when you do have that in your forefront, your mind is that you really can't really slip up. I mean, sometimes I, I don't think it really is a worry of mm -hmm. most people, most Catholics that I'm going to screw this up. Um, like you, you, do think, know, yeah. you do know right from wrong. You do know mm -hmm. um, what we're called to do. And, Honestly, I think a lot of us can look back and think like the simpler choices were really the, you know, what really sticks out in our mind. And um, anyway. And, and well, the thing with Fred, uh, his character is he he's like our, our first indication, indication of someone who, whether or not his situation might not be as grand as he, he may have even have hoped or what he expected in life, he's still merry. He still mm -hmm. finds joy and meaning in his life. Yes. Um, so now, I, yeah. But also just, um, I guess I also like his relationship with Scrooge. Like he, I don't know if you're going to get to this, but like he does not let Scrooge's attitude affect him. At least no. not that we could tell in this book, uh, no. which is very, um, it's, kind of something that we need to strive for because we're, we're we all are gonna have scrooges come our way <laughs> uh, maybe we are scrooge at times and it's just or, it, i like how at least seemingly to me mm -hmm. that fred does not give up on his uncle and yes. i think yeah. that actually uh plays into uh you know the turnaround too like, well and you know you and that's a very good point as you bring up sister because you know fred does state uh, later on in the book that he is always going to invite his uncle. He's always going to extend that olive branch. And it's a lesson for us. You know, no matter how many times a person says, no, 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 we should always be willing to invite them with charity to, uh, oh, of course, uh, to get togethers and have an, a, a friendly time, but also inviting them to the faith by our words, our actions, our deeds, yes. inviting them to church. Um, but what's the most inviting thing we can do is practicing our faith and influencing people in that way. Because if, you know, if we approached people about our Catholic faith like a Scrooge, and as some people actually view Catholics being very negative and being so sad, uh, yeah. sad then that's going to be their impression. They're going to want nothing to do with you. But you got to show us we're more like Fred. Mm -hmm. upbeat, be Fred. And be Fred. Be Fred. Be happy, upbeat, and always willing to to go that extra mile to extend that invitation, and be willing to help wherever you can. That uh, he he really he really shows himself at being a fine moral character because Fred. I think you'd probably list him. He's not the poor. He's not the wealthy. Fred is in the middle class. Uh, though, by the way, he's described. I, I, he is not actually stated. Of course, in Dickens' time, I don't know if he, they would actually would have referred to it as the middle class, but that's exactly what he was. Uh, now, 
And the next, after Fred leaves and you had uh, the gentleman coming looking for donations, of course, Scrooge promptly tells them uh, no. But in he doesn't just say no. He explains that he's, he does support the poor. I'm pay, he pays for prisons. He prays for poor houses. Now, this because here we see how the difference between doing th- something out of charity and doing something merely out of civic duty. I'm giving to the poor just because. I, I mean, heck, Scrooge isn't even doing it to look good. He's mm-hmm. doing it because the government makes him do it. Yeah, well, well, there are things such thing as tax write-offs back then. <laughs> I don't know. You know, if there were, he would have been. I right, of it. Right. Scrooge may have created that. Maybe the tax write off. <laughs> so he says, I support. And that's and I, I'm doing what I have to do. And that's enough. Uh, we don't want to have that attitude when it comes yeah. to our faith. You don't want bare minimum. I'm, I'm doing what I have to do. And that's enough. With our faith, it's never enough. We always have to keep striving. That's what we got to remember. Our Lord said, be perfect because your heavenly Father is perfect. That doesn't mean that we're going to achieve the perfection of God. That is impossible. That is so impossible, there's not a word to describe how impossible that is in our language. But what that means is, since it is an actual impossibility, we still have potential, the potential possibility. So we still have to keep striving, meaning we can never let up. We have to always keep going and doing more and more to serve God, to please God. I mean, I guess in a way, like when you you hear it that way, Mm -hmm. understand it that way, it just, it sounds kind of says like, well, so God's asking us to do something that we actually can't do, but that, you know, I'm glad you followed up like what that actually means, because I think people read that and like, yeah, they, they, so. they, well, that 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 well, that's what prompts uh, the false interpretation that you find uh, certain Protestants get into with with that. Well, we can't be perfect, so it's it's just it's all it's it is God uh, working. It's all just God working us, and we have no real say in the matter. Our free will is not uh, as much of a factor as it as as it is in reality. Um, It's actually prompting us to do our good works. Yes. The love of God. Um, So one of the things that we do in striving towards perfection is how we treat others and how we help. And here's where you have a lesson in Catholic just uh, social justice. And it, it is founded on, charity and mercy and justice itself if if you do things for another person desiring the best for them not looking for compensation not looking for recognition but just to help them as by helping them monetarily you may be relieving a burden so now they can focus more upon their soul and their salvation and in that, you're being merciful to them. If you are the, if someone owes you a debt, and you can afford to um, relinquish that debt, then do so to help. You know, to help them from their burden. You know, you you. This is one of the reasons why the Saint Nicholas was known to help the poor so much, and he went in in the middle of the night, leaving them. Uh, sacks of gold by their windowsills or in their uh, in their shoot work shoes, as this legend goes. Uh, he did it that way so they would not have the shame of needing to ask and to beg. Uh, so, and I guess also was, not to feel obligated to pay back. That's too. true. If you don't know, it's you need to pay gift. back. Um, and, and, and so that's a lesson for us, you know. The and for those who have much. As our Lord said, much is expected. And you just follow the the the, the maxim from Pope Leo the Thirteenth, who if you want to know what the church teaches on social justice, um, read his encyclical Rerum Novarum, 
And in that, I believe it's that one. He's wrote in quite a few, but I believe it's in that one where he explicitly states that the rich should should only keep what is necessary for their needs and their station in life. Beyond that, the rest belongs to the poor. Now that is a very it's a very fair way of looking at it. And if you followed Spoke Leo's advice, there would be no real suffering in the world. Um, we're always going to have the poor. Mm-hmm. We're always going to have the poor. Our Lord said, the poor you always have with you. Of course, does that only mean monetarily poor? Because could our Lord have that we all we will always have those who are um, poor, uh, poor in spiritual goods mm-hmm. and graces who need help there's always there's always the spiritual aspect to it uh anyway so a- after little oh, sister i'm sorry i heard oh. a well i just want to i guess say that in that part of the book mm-hmm. um it was just said that, and it just kind of hit me because usually it's this time of year that people are more generous. And sometimes yeah. it's just, it's this time of year and then they're forgotten. And that's not mm-hmm. really true. I, you know, yeah. we, we can't always give every day of the year, month of mm-hmm. the year. Uh, but it just, I think what I like about what they said there, it was along the lines of, it's just that the reason why people um, give more at this time of year is because the needy feel feel the need for it more yeah it's just like yep. it's, it's this time of year when you really notice what yep. you're without and i thought yes i really i'm glad that mm-hmm. i heard that it's articulated that way because i always had a hard time you mm-hmm. know because we all tend to do something extra this time of year mm-hmm. uh, and, and then we really get shamed for it. it's like well then do you really care about the poor uh the rest of the year well of course we do we do try our best to help well, out but yeah but we also know this this season is very special to us even as religious we do celebrate to some degree and if there's someone we know that has been going by with very little we are going to make sure that they do have something um so i just i just really like that point so well and you know that's you no know, that is all very true and we can find ourselves uh, feeling just, guilty. We feel guilty the year, but you know what? People, most people, do have other responsibilities. They they need to save their money, mm-hmm. and they have a time where they can direct it. You know, at Christmas time, we're gonna give a little back uh, because they save up for that. You know, they're preparing right. themselves for that. It, right. There's nothing wrong with that. There's no. you know, as long. Just- the idea of nitpicking, you know, like, you know, yeah. we just, we do that too much. And it's just like, let's just be a generous for the love of God. And if you truly gave mm-hmm. the best that you could, then it is good enough. Yep. <laughs> you know, you know what you can afford. Mm-hmm. And God loves a generous giver. Now, as you know, Scrooge locks up, you know, locks up his office, Cratchit is on his way, getting his day off of Christmas. Um, which I love one of the lines in there is that Scrooge is just, says, I, supp- I suppose you'll be wanting a whole day off tomorrow. And Cratchit's, well, if it's convenient, Mr. Scrooge, no, it's not convenient. I suppose you would find me unfair if I were to dock you a day's wages. And that never dawned on me before. It's like, oh, wait a minute. Yeah, I mean, he was. I guess Cratchit was expecting a paid holiday. <laughs> yeah, I, you know that, that is that is true. I never, you know, you don't think about that when you're a kid. Yeah, um, yeah. You're like, oh yeah, it's just like a Scrooge to pay him for not doing work. <laughs> it's interest. It's it is interesting, but uh, but so Scrooge just goes goes home, and that's where he sees on his door knocker the face of his dead partner who has been dead for seven years, Jacob Marley and Marley visits him and they have a, you know, uh, Marley is the one that, you know, tells Scrooge what's going to happen if he does not reform his life. Marley is the one that tells him that he is creating chains 
that will uh, that will weigh him down, pretty much down to hell. Um, and he has a chance. He has a chance. He needs to take advantage of the chance. He's going to be visited by three spirits. Um, th- th- this really prompted me to think about the reality of the supernatural, the reality of how spirits uh, play a part in our lives, uh, my guardian angels predominantly, um, in guiding us, influencing us uh, to do good, to avoid evil. But then you also have the evil spirits, the demons, the devil, um, tempting us to sin, luring us with the things of this world, one of them being um, uh, the desire for worldly things, which is we see Scrooge is a uh, is guilty of. He's a victim of his own greed. Um, and in that, he is also uncharitable. Uh, but also, we see the belief that we're supposed to have in these spirits. Um, I, I remember actually reading uh, a book, one of the many books <laughs> I'm reading right now. It's um, philosophy uh, according to uh, Tolkien. And love the book it's going over um one of the areas of philosophy is angelology study of angels the study of the spiritual and the author in here quotes actually c.s lewis in his way of logically deducing the existence of these spirits and like the stories of a house like man's on the bottom story God's on the top, but there are other stories. It's not impossible, improbable, or illogical to think that there are other beings between man and God, just like there are various floors between the the basement and the roof. I'm not giving it justice in my explanation, but it's really... You know, it's a, it's a natural way of thinking about it. Of course, we know angels exist uh, through Scripture. It's been divinely revealed. Uh, but even though we know they exist by way of Scripture, uh, if that's all we know, then they really only become products of fairy tales. They, they, it's their reality. They're with us right now as we're all sitting here um as we're doing this podcast, as you're listening to this podcast, your angels are there and so are the devils. And we have to be aware of that. Not that we're going to think about it all the time, but especially in the times of prayer and thanksgiving and the times of temptation, which of course then we should resort to prayer. We have to be aware of the spiritual combat, the spiritual warfare that's taking a place right in front of us. It, it's it's the battle for our souls. St. Paul says, you know, it's not against flesh and blood that we battle, but it's against uh, principalities and powers. This, this is a reality. And we recognize the spiritual. Scrooge didn't recognize the spiritual. Scrooge was, uh, his comment to, um, to Marley was that he was just a bit of ein- undigested beef, a glob of mustard, or a crumb of cheese. Of course, <laughs> in, in, in that, it just started making me think as well. There's a bit of uh, truth in when we discern spirits, when we're trying to discern which is a godly spirit, which is a demonic spirit, uh, which one is leading us towards virtue, which one is leading us towards vice. Because sometimes um, the evil spirit approaches us very subtly, like the serpent. And that's when they trap us. That's when they get us. So we have to be aware of those pitfalls. But how many people, because they're not temperate, they're not prudent, they uh, they fast, they abstain too much, and then they start having visions. Uh, they start believing that things are not actually there. Um, when I say visions, that's in air quotes. Uh, they're not actual visions because we're not told to trust 
of just any vision. We're not told to trust uh, dreams and how they're and what secrets they can reveal. That's uh, say John of the Cross goes into that in his book uh, Ascent to Mount Carmel in great detail. Uh, but also we get a lesson here in, in how that there is to be a proper amount of fasting and abstaining um, for the betterment of our soul um, to, to suffer a little uh, want and to uh, prepare ourselves for the spiritual combat um, as like St. Paul describes uh, the preparation of, of the Catholic has to be that of the athlete, where we deny ourselves of certain lawful things so we can be prepared to stand up against the onslaughts of the devil, but also be prepared to receive the help of God's grace, which is very often given to us through the medium of our guardian angels and other good spirits. Uh, the supernatural is a reality and in order for a person to really appreciate the lessons being taught by the three spirits of Christmas past, present, and future, you have to, uh, suspend disbelief and, and, uh, accept, uh, the supernatural, um, The ghost of Christmas past uh, that comes to visit Scrooge later on in the night or actually the morning and when the bell tolls one and he's he, the spirit is described in a very interesting way. He's like, he looks like a child, the size of a child, but like an old man. So it's really kind of hard to depict what he's supposed to look like. Um, but he takes Scrooge on a journey to see um, the see Scrooge's conduct, which we do when we uh, examine our conscience, um, which we should do each night. Uh, we yeah. are visiting the past. Um, we're also taught to learn from our past failures and successes, um, how we can take these lessons and to grow in holiness, uh, but also not to obsess too much upon the failures because that's what we often do i i um because if if we obsess too much over past sins ones that have been confessed we inadvertently create an obstacle which hinders the advancement of virtue and that's not what you want you want to draw closer to god that is scrupulosity in its uh most blatant form what a person has to understand is that if you are feeling anxious about your sins, if you're feeling worked up over this and overly, uh, like uncontrollably emotional, I might talk about true contrition and true atonement for the sin. I know as someone who keep who acts like their sins can never be forgiven, or because they do not have a uh, they it's not may know to them that their soul is now squeaky clean, uh, that they can move forward next to sin. Anxiety is the greatest evil that can befall a soul. Thus says St. Francis de Sales. So when it comes to our past, when it comes to looking back, we learn from it so it can help our present and then ensure a future pleasing God, and then getting to heaven. For... <laughs> Excuse me. So that's that's one of the things that makes me think about with the ghost of Christmas present. Um, but, you know, I also like the um, the lessons we learn because you know Scrooge. Uh, well, Scrooge is brought by this by by the spirit you know, to his old school. And he got to watch all the other kids, the other boys running off to their to their uh, Christmas vacations. And he's left by himself. You also have another time where, yeah, once again, he's left by himself. But his sister, Fanny, comes and lets him know that, you know, now now Scrooge can, you know, he's 
can return home. Father wants him home. And apparently uh, the reason why uh, Scrooge's father uh, was a, was upset with him, I, I, I guess it's because of uh, reminding, reminding him Scrooge's father of his, uh, of his wife's death, Scrooge's mother. I, I don't remember this, how well that's explained, but I just like the two lessons we learn here is how siblings should get along with one, with one another. Um, it is a horrible thing when you see brothers and sisters not get along. I'm not saying don't they don't argue or spat once in a while. Right. But to like never want to see your brother and sister, that's I, I, I of course, sister, those are those cases where you have individuals who have gone so far off the deep end. Uh, you can't really be around them until right. they straighten up. But I'm right. talking about petty different petty differences, <laughs> you know. Um, well, and I don't know if you're this is something that you're going to cover, but what I did kind of like about this part of the story is the you know um, how you know Scrooge wasn't the way Scrooge was because mm -hmm. of, there's he had a hard childhood, really. Yep. I mean, probably maybe kind of standard in those yep. times. I'm not really yep. sure. But when it's just a good reminder for us that we really don't know what someone has gone through. When someone's, you know, aggravating you, someone's not treating you kindly, uh, mm -hmm. maybe, maybe it's um, really just due to something that happened to them, you know, that, mm -hmm. you know, they're not trust they're not trusting of anyone because they've been hurt so much and they haven't mm -hmm. worked through it. And that's why we just, we do need to be patient with others because there are, we can all look back on circumstances in our lives, good, bad, that have shaped us, you know, have, you know, done good. Um, maybe some things, you know, maybe not so great, but um, no one's obviously without a past. And, um, we, we definitely just need to put that into consideration. Uh, it made me think about, and I just lost it. Shoot. Um, <laughs> um, oh, it just kind of made me think of the movie uh, about St. Therese that was made in the mm -hmm. 90s. The one that you, I guess you, you like pretty well enough. I was okay with it. Uh, but it reminds me of the scene where uh, St. Therese is trying to befriend another sister and like always, you know, trying to do nice things for her, be, be basically in her personal space. And the sister's just like, you know, more or less being rude. I don't know. If, I don't know if really rude is the proper term, but that's how you could see it as and I was watching this with a, um, a student mm -hmm. and he's just like, why is, why is that sister being so mean to her? And I said, well, maybe, you know, because we don't know anything about this sister. Mm -hmm. Maybe this sister was an orphan and maybe she didn't have any friends. She didn't have what St. Therese had growing up, a loving family, mm -hmm. sisters and her father. Even she has memories of her mother. Maybe this sister was horribly let down by people and she just does not trust other people. And she mm -hmm. needs to, um, and Therese needs to earn that trust. You know, it's, it's a work yep. in progress. I mean, just because you're both religious sisters doesn't mean that you're going to be BFFs. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and it just kind of makes me think of the future. But, um, you know, it's just just because St. Therese was very good, very kind, doesn't mean that everybody was going to be very receptive to that. You know, we all have certain temperaments that we're drawn to, but again, it's just the reminder of you really don't know what's going on in someone's life and why they may have acted a certain way or made choices and seem very harsh and mean. Um, so anyway. Well, the thing is, is that we are all created by God. And everything that God creates is good. Now, aside, of course, from the effects of the fall and original sin, a person's baptized. Say an infant is baptized. That, that now they are fused to sanctifying grace. It is good. A child is good. And we don't know. Um, sorry, I got distracted there. Um uh, that you know, because something does not is is not born evil. 
Something has not created evil. That's how I want to put it. Okay. Something has not created evil. It's, it's good. It is only through time when a person, as an individual, doesn't uh, work with God's grace. Um, they reject revealed truth. They give in to the world. That that soul then becomes greedy, um, avaricious, becoming uh, vengeful, hateful, all these negative things. That's something that festers in, in, in a person. Um, those vices um, take hold of the individual and to the point where it's no longer a habit. It's a necessity. They must do these things. Um, that is something that happens over time. It doesn't, you don't start off that way. So Scrooge is an example of someone that you could see in the way it's written. Scrooge was not a bad kid, but by, by uh, maybe certain things in his life, this because he suffered, he had to go through the death of his sister. He had to suffer through the death of also his uh, his partner. Uh, but before that, you know, you started showing the signs of being avaricious. I mean, he he had a a, a fiance, uh, Belle, who he loved greatly. But you know, even his his noble intentions were corrupted by greed. I mean, he may have gone in say i have to make sure i provide and i can't we can't live in po uh, poverty or pet or uh, uh penury so i have to make sure everything's in place before we get married it's uh uh one thing you find here is a lack of trust in god that he will help you through the uh through your uh marriage and help you through um any of the uh, financial problems you're going to have Always making sure you have enough. You might not have an abundance of material things, but enough to get by uh, relying on hard work and the charity and goodness of others. God will help you. Um, Scrooge was not prepared for that. So in his anxiety over that and his aptitude for business, he, be, he gave in to greed, he gave in to avarice, and then the negativities of his life, which he never resolved, uh, so it happened to his sister, and also the way that his father treated him, um, he gave in to something that he wanted uh, to use to fill that empty void in his life. Um, now that the sister was gone, um, he, well, he found it in his bride, in Belle, but guess what? It wasn't enough. Now, here we see it's a lesson that God has to be a part of it for it to really blossom, to really flourish. So he turned to another love. Not saying that Belle didn't show him love because the way it's written is that she she, she, she didn't wish him evil. She pitied him. Mm. But she had to leave him because he could because of his um his gross negativity. I mean, he had good influences. He had like Mr. Fozzywig was his first real implorer mm -hmm. and he was a uh, 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 fuzzy wig i said fuzzy wig you did and the thing is it's I, fuzzy I, wig I, it's I fuzzy didn't... wig it's i said <laughs> well, i was actually thinking about the the movie as you're yeah. talking well, uh, of, of <laughs> fuzzy wig who was a generous man who was who, who would give them time off because time to celebrate who wasn't worried about all of the um uh, of the bills and stuff at the time but even if Scrooge had the opportunity to help his old employer, he refused. It, it, it's a, a really sad situation. And um, it, it just shows how a person can get misdirected in their life um, if, if, if they do not have the proper foundation in their spirituality. And ex understanding one and very important thing, God's divine will. See, with God's divine will, we have to recall that no matter what happens, we have to be willing to accept it with patience and trusting that the good that God intends will come from it. Whether If we don't understand it, it doesn't matter. It says we trust that God's will will be for our um, greater good maybe later on in life. And accepting of it.
we build in a foundation being able to withstand any sort of hardship, any sort of, excuse me, difficult situation. Uh, Scrooge obviously uh, did not uh, prepare his storehouse of spiritual goods um, to combat this. Um, and so he was prone to this, giving in to his, his um, um, avarice. And then he lost a woman that you could say was love of his life. Then also being shown by the spirit how happy she was in the simple life with her husband and her children. This simple life and even how they pitied, how, her, how Belle's husband pitied Scrooge talking about him. You know, he's like, you know, I saw him. I saw him walk the streets. And he gives off an air of a very unhappy man. That's uh, really, is, it's a sad thing when you think about it. All right. Nothing? Well, I no, mean. <laughs> no, no, uh, no anecdotes? I That's guess fine. not because we... We're only uh, like we're about a third of a way through. I mean, uh, we need to get into like the present and the future. So, okay. Well, well, we will get into the present presently. Uh, the the next go, the next spirit which visits um, Scrooge is the ghost of Christmas present, and you know Scrooge again. He wounds up in his bedroom. After after his uh, time at the, the spirit of Christmas past, he's back in his bedroom. It's once again, the bell tolls one. You know, there you see time, how, how funny it can be. And, you know, he, he, he hears the ghost of Christmas present, this, this giant of a man, this boisterous man, this jolly fellow dressed in green with a, with a wreath of holly on his head saying, come in and know me better, man. Uh, he represents, he and his feast, he had a feast of food and um, on a big table in front of him. And, it's, of course, the spirit and his feast represent generosity and goodwill. And it's it just, it's it's like the attitude that we are supposed to, supposed to have uh regularly continuously um throughout throughout our lives throughout the day um so that is a very important uh lesson we get from the coast of christmas present um one of the things is that as he's taking scrooge around um he's taking scrooge around the city the town the city and seeing how people are interacting with one another, you know, you have people who, you know, for the most part are jolly, but whenever there is a disagreement, well, the spirit, you know, he sprinkles them with a little incense from his torch because he walks around with a torch and all the quarreling and the disagreements cease and their good humor and a peace, you know, again, uh, fills their souls. And, it reminds me of like when Christ said to be the light of the world and also how our prayers should, should smoke up to God like incense. So with our faith and good works, that's how we're an example to, uh, to all men because we show forth the gospel in that. And if our prayers um, rise up um, in, in trust um, and in love of God, you know, that will also influence our fellow man. And, and these, these are just wonderful things that we can learn from. Right. And it just brings to my mind how great those short prayers are for an instance like that is that, you know, you could be walking down the street or in the store and you, you see people bickering or, um, something and, you know, even at that moment, offer up a prayer for them, you know, that mm -hmm. maybe their issue will be resolved. Um, it's really mm -hmm. the best thing that you can do. Uh, well, yeah, most certainly. It's, it's, you know, it's instead of getting angry at a person for what they have said or done for them, you know, we say a prayer. 
Um, I, it made me think of a, a, I guess, a hack, if you will, that I saw years ago uh, that uh, the idea was if you find yourself in an argument with someone or a disagreement or someone says something that hurt you before you do anything else, crop, make a little cross on your lips and say, uh, glory to, you know, something, you know, Dale gracias, uh, um, you know, praise be to God, something that will put God right there in your mind in that he in the moment where you're tempted to fight back, you know, an eye for an eye situation. So, um, I thought that was kind of of a neat um, idea there. So mm -hmm. cleanse my lips, Lord. I think that's what I was trying to remember ah. uh, because how, how many sins are committed by our tongue and our, yeah. our lips. So exactly. Um, yeah. And it just it reminds us to have that, you know, get back to our senses and have that, uh, good spirit dwell within us. Um, well, then you get other examples here. Uh, you know, you know, Tiny Tim, I think, is a great example of accepting God's will because that's where you know the spirit took uh, Scrooge next to, to the Cratchit's house, and and you know, seeing this this boy, you know, in his illness, he was still upbeat and joyful. Um, he did not allow that, uh, his illness to be a, uh, uh, well, a crutch, <laughs> uh, to his, uh, uh, to, to his joy. Mm -hmm. And even the, uh, the whole Cratchit family, you should, you saw how they appreciated what they had. They didn't have a lot. Although of course, when, uh, um, Dickens gives the description of everything they had, I was like, that actually seemed like quite a good feast to me, but, um, yeah, that is too, to I, 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 I guess if that's poor, then that's, uh, it's not too bad, but, um, but, but we don't know what, what it costs them to do that. Though. That's true. Well, that's true. That's a good point. We don't they know how much that cost. They made a sacrifice quite a bit the weeks leading up to it. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's not that, yeah. that, um, particular moment, the sacrifice is mm -hmm. obvious. I mean, if there's still a sacrifice there, but it was, the build up to it. And, and and at the point of their meal, Cratchit, Bob Cratchit, you know, dedicates it to his employer, Mr. Scrooge. And it's kind of giving credit where credit's due and appreciating what Mr. Scrooge has done for him by giving him a job. And, you know, that's Bob Cratchit putting the positive spin on it and how he uh, treats his employer, not getting so upset and angry and, and bitter. bitter about it. Just saying, well, you know, this is what we agreed on. Right. Right. And I can I just say that as we're talking about the story, I just keep picturing the Muppets. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and I, and I only say it next point and where, you know, well, you know, after seeing the Cratchits and the spirit takes Scrooge again through the town, witnessing how people act and going then to see Fred and, and how he's celebrating Christmas. And we talked about it before, so I don't actually have to say too much, but you know, he was a man of, he has a good name. He had a good reputation and he was an exa He's an example of the pity that we should show a person who is the obstinate sinner instead of cursing them out, you know, having pity and praying for them, mm -hmm. wanting what's good for them. I mean, like you said, I will always go back and every year invite See, him. And that remind me of a, something I read in our med, one of our meditations months ago, and it really uh, stood out to me. It was along the lines of, you know, talking about our enemies, you know, people we don't get along with and mm -hmm. how, if we're really honest, if we're not praying for them, we actually don't want them to go to heaven. You know mm -hmm. how you, you might not think of it in exact precisely that, but if you're kind of not willing to help them and I'm, and helping people that have hurt you, doesn't necessarily mean putting yourself in harm's way. You know, uh, mm -hmm. you might have to, uh, do this from a distance. You know, there are some people that you absolutely just need to not be in the same room with. I understand mm -hmm. that but you still need to pray for them. I mean, how many people are we in a disagreement with that we fought with that we're not praying for? And if you're not praying for them, you are 
in essence saying you don't want them to go to heaven. You don't, you, you, you don't think they're capable of change um, or that, you know, they're not deserving of God's graces, however it is. And it's um, it, that just stood out to me. It's like, yeah, you know, Mm -hmm. really need to pray for our fellow man, um, especially those who have hurt us. I mean, that's, and that's what Christ taught us. So Love your enemies. Do good to those who persecute and calumniate you, which is a hard lesson. But now we know why. But we can see why it'd be worthwhile because it does require sacrifice mm-hmm. on our part. The one, the last thing that really stands out with the ghost of Christmas present and, and Scrooge's interaction with him was right at the end uh, when Scrooge was starting to show his his remorse, uh, be, be, having the positive influence of the Cratchits, of his nephew, and especially that of Tiny Tim, um, which is an example of how uh, the company we keep affects us. If we're around good people, a virtuous people, we're more prone to be virtuous and good. So when we're around bad people, it's when we're more, we can fall into being bad. Mm-hmm. Um, but the spirit then reveals hidden under his cloak two um, children, um, obviously poor and needy, a boy and a girl. Uh, the boy is called ignorance and the girl is called want. The thing that the spirit was bringing home to Scrooge to understand is that, you know, there's certain things that we cannot be ignorant about. And the needs of our neighbor to purposely ignore that, um, it, it, it's it's a grave sin. Now, we can extend that to all areas of our faith for a person to ignore their faith, to ignore revealed truth, to, to purposely deny. There's no excuse for that. Uh, we have to pray that you know, we would never be in a situation where we uh, we we allow ourselves to become so ignorant that we blind ourselves. Always be ready. Always be docile to God's grace. And if we pray for that, we will not be ignorant. You know, ignorant and what's necessary not to be ignorant and what's necessary for salvation. We should have that knowledge, and we should look to achieve that each and every day. Um, Well, finally, the ghost of Christmas future, uh, you know, he appears like the Grim Reaper. He's he's probably the uh, scariest character of the whole tale, and it reminds it makes me think of what it means by the future and that you know yes god knows our future because he is all knowing but we don't know our future we know what christ told us if you love me keep my commandments if you confess me before men i'll confess you before my father in heaven he also said i am the way the truth and the life and he's also said that if he wants one fold one shepherd it, basically, that if we follow God's grace, uh, uh, follow his inspirations, working with his grace, doing what we have to do, and then desiring to do more, living a Christian life, then we will be among the elect. At every moment you're in the state of sanctifying grace, you are among the elect. And that is what we have to pray for that final perseverance. Because we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. We don't know how we're going to end up future, when our time to die is. And, and of course, as we know, Scrooge faced his own mortality, seeing his own grave. Actually, there was a point in there that you don't really get in the uh, storybooks. I mean, in the movies, but in the book itself, I should say, uh, that Scrooge actually had an opportunity of, of seeing his own body dead on the uh, on his bed, he refused to. He refused to see it. 
A man mm -hmm. cannot refuse to, to be aware of his own mortality. The candle is very brief. It's going to burn out eventually. We have to keep striving ourselves towards God and living our life like it is our last. And if we keep God before our minds, we will not sin. And that is the lesson we learn from this, uh, the, the, uh, the spirit of Christmas future. Um, but also that we can see the possibilities. I mean, that obviously that future was not set in stone. Scrooge is able to change it becoming a changed man, saying, I'm not the man I was. I will honor Christmas with all my heart and try to keep it all the year. He became a truly contrite soul. So he didn't live in the past. He had to learn. He learned from his past. So he lived in the present, constantly directing his mind towards God, living in every moment. How we look to the future. We look to heaven. We look to being with God with confidence. That's how, that's the beauty of time. As long as God is the foundation of all these things. And since it's not written for us, there's always a chance. As long as there's breath, there is hope. There's hope of repentance and to be with God. And there's hope of drawing closer to him in holiness. That's really what I want to, I want to take the positive side of the ghost of Christmas future, you know, and, and, and not get dragged down by the, the looming fear of the unknown. We have that, but have confidence in God. That's, I think that's the theme. Well, that's saying we should have like that looming fear of what's to come, you know, mm -hmm. but don't let that, you know, take over. I think like we mm -hmm. still need to we still need to live mm -hmm. where we are in the present now. And as good faithful Catholics, there's still time. Um, mm -hmm. however long that is, but uh make it count. It sounds very uh, I don't know, kind of cliche, I guess, but um oh. it's Anyway, I just, <laughs> well, this has been very fascinating. It's yeah, huge. well, at, at the last chapter of it, which Dickens calls the last day, if he calls the end of it, it the, the aftermath of Scrooge's visions. And, and you know, S Scrooge had no concept of time when he was experiencing this. So he, he uh, didn't even know what day it was. So I think we all know the, the classic scene where, Scrooge looks out his window and sees that young boy and saying, what day is today? And the boy tells him it's Christmas day. And, you know, Scrooge kneels down and he, he thanks Jacob Marley. He thanks the spirits. He thanks for you know, thanking them for helping him no longer be the man he was, that he is a man of, be a man of goodwill and of good cheer, a generous soul. This reminds me of how we need to have gratitude to God for all of his blessings and a gratitude to all the angels and the saints for everything they do for us, especially the Blessed Virgin Mary. And it, and how God, you know, he rewards us a hundredfold. You know how at the end when... Uh, Bob Cratchit comes late into work, making Mary and Scrooge was having a bit of fun with him. Oh, and then tells him after, after Cratchit thinks he's about to be fired, says, I'm about to raise your salary. It's interesting. God is always ready to raise our salary because mm -hmm. he is generous. And of course, I kind of jumped a point because I wanted to note how when Scrooge was running to the town, all happy as a, as a schoolboy, as he put it, as light as an angel. Uh, he, he encountered those men that asked him for a donation and, and he, he wanted to make one, but also back payments. And he, this reminds me of wishing to be anonymous with our gestures of kindness or any good works and to expect nothing from that person in, in return. And it kind of goes back to what you were saying uh, earlier on in the episode, sister, is how, uh, you know, our good deeds, you can't help helping yourself. 
when you do a good for someone else, you are building, or I should say you are laying a treasure in heaven. And hopefully becoming, a treasure you can share with others. Yeah. yeah. It, it, it's a treasure beyond all comprehension because it's, it, it's a spiritual one. It's one mm -hmm. that draws you closer to God. Mm -hmm. So these among probably many other lessons we can learn, we can learn from the story of the Christmas Carol. If you take it from a, a truly Catholic perspective, um, a, a perspective um, and, you know, to say, you know, uh, you know, as they say that last line in there is God bless us, everyone to truly mean that to mm -hmm. may God bless everyone, yep. bless them with his grace, bless those who are hungry, bless them with, 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 with the needs of their body, with those who are ignorant of their faith, bless them with the knowledge, those who lack charity, bless them with charity. Bless with overabundance that their cups may fill and pour over to their fellow man. This is, these are the wonderful lessons we can learn, but we have to take the time to really ponder and pray about these things. Well, and I think that's what was actually kind of fun about this discussion. Um, and I know I told you before we started uh, of course, my mind's starting to go like the after story. And that's what's hard mm -hmm. about some books. It's like, well, I don't want it to end. I mean, yep. what, um, you know, did Scrooge maintain his good, uh, good um, intention going uh -huh. forward? Um, and, uh, you know, because it, it's one of those like, because knowing ourselves, like, yeah, we'll probably be good for a little while mm -hmm. and kind of screwed up. Kind of like you go to confession, yep. you get your sins taken away, you're feeling good, you receive the sacraments. And, you know, obviously, if you're not careful, you could fall into the same um, faults and failings. And um, I mean, when we know not to get discouraged by that, you know, every time you fall, pick yourself back up, mm -hmm. try it over. So I'm sure Scrooge had a lot of work <laughs> to go no. through. I mean, when you kind of, you take the story as it's told, you think, oh yeah, and then and they all lived happily ever after yeah. you know like yeah. all was well no mistakes were made ever again but he was, he was a saint overnight yeah um and yeah. so uh you know realistically we know that he probably had a lot of work ahead and it just because we have a lot of work mm -hmm. ahead you know every hurdle that we climb there's always going to be something else coming our way and you know and that's a fight that mm -hmm. we're going to have until we die and so, you know I think if you want to compare Scrooge to to some, I think you compare him to a Saint Paul. For his visits by the spirits, that was his road to Damascus. And as Saint Paul explains in his epistles, mm -hmm. he was traveling uh, through various dangers, dealing with hunger, dealing with sickness, with want, shipwreck persecution, all these things. And sure, there are times that even St. Paul felt discouragement, but he maintained his faith. He kept on going and he would, I'm sure, repeat to himself what he said to, to, to Lord, right, right after uh, he appeared to him, what would you have me do? And when we get discouraged, we just go to God and say, Lord, what would you have me do? Mm -hmm. And God tells us, I would have you lift up your hearts, be joyful for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Deo gracias. Deo gracias. God bless us, everyone. <laughs>